And for me, acting is, is creating magic. It's creating that sense of, this is happening right now just for you. Welcome to the Creative Mindset Podcast. My name is Isolde Trachtenberg, and I'm super happy you're here. On the show, I focus on creative thinking, problem solving, and living. Most often, I'll discuss how to ignite inspiration, meet challenges, and achieve goals through creative thinking. Sometimes I'll have guests who give their perspective. Usually, it's people who are already living their best and most creative lives. Okay, let's get to it. I'm so excited to bring you this next guest. Paul Liberti is an amazing person as well as an incredible teacher. He's one of my teachers, in fact. And wow, have I learned a lot from him. He currently teaches competitive classes in L.A. and New York City and nationally for sag After Foundation and also independently in commercial voiceover, audiobook narration, video game, character work, animation, he does everything. He also teaches accents for actors, and he teaches it for film actors, Broadway actors, animation, voice. As I said, he does it all. He also has worked on shows like Disney's Frozen and USA Network's Falling Water, the National Theater's One Night in Miami, and Greater Tuna, Anastasia, My Fair Lady, Brigadoon. He teaches to graduating university students from across the nation at Western Michigan University and Oakland University and many others. He's booked tons, hundreds of voiceover spots and animated series, including Pokemon and Blue's Clues, Noggins, Saturday Night Live cartoons, and Sesame Street. And he's currently the voice of Curious George, which is really close to my heart because I learned how to speak English in part or actually read English in part because of Curious George and also The Man in the Yellow Hat. So he's narrated for Scholastic, Nickelodeon, the audio award-winning series Goosebumps by R.L. Stein, and he's also performed on Broadway. He was in A Chorus Line, y'all, A Chorus Line, and he's done tons of Broadway tours and TV, including The Daily Show, Saturday Night Live, PBS, Nickelodeon, Showtime, and more. And on top of all that, he's just an amazing human being. I'm thrilled to welcome to the show, Paul Liberti. Hello, and welcome to the Creative Mindset Podcast. My name is Isolde Trachtenberg, and I'm so happy that you're here, and I'm so happy to have, as I refer to him, the great Paul Liberti on the show with me. <laughs> yeah, it's so great to be here. Thank you, Paul. I'm so glad that you are here. Uh, so yeah. before we go any further, I just want to say how grateful I am for all of the guidance that you've given me. So for all of you listening, Paul is my voice teacher, my, my voice acting teacher, and he has shed light and pulled back the, the, the curtains on so much knowledge and wisdom. So I'm going to, you're going to hear me gush a little, I apologize in advance, <laughs> but, <laughs> but, well, but because I've had, as I'm a teacher, forgive me for interrupting, I'm a teacher and I've had some great teachers in my life. So I feel like um, we become who we are by our teachers in life. And I think that's, you know, who we pass on from too. So that's part of it. Absolutely. That inspiration early on does, it's, it informs everything we do. If, if you have great teachers, even, even just one great teacher in your life who inspires you to strive and to try, it can change the course of your life. I, I certainly was lucky enough to have that both in music and in writing, luckily. So let's talk. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. I'm a singer. I'm actually a singer first and a violinist and guitarist second and third. And then acting comes after that a little bit, but, uh, but I, you know, I love it all. So yeah. I, I, I want to talk to you. There's so much, there's so much, everything from you're the voice of Curious George to you performed in a chorus line. So, so you have me because Curious George is in part how I learned to speak English. So you had me <laughs> from very early on, uh, as, as an immigrant, Curious George was very important to me. And, uh, and also a chorus line, which is one of my favorite shows. So, 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 so many different touch points. But, but let's talk about that, that idea of inspiration. You, you brought it up, and I'd love to know who are, what, what inspires you? Who are your inspirations? One of my greatest teachers was Jim Henson. And I got to work with Jim um, pretty young in my life. I just knew I was going to work with Jim Henson. And I just knew I was going to do that. So I made it happen. And I, I started because I was a dancer and an actor. I started working at Sesame Place. And I worked my way to dance captain. And Brian Henson was working there at the time. This was in the early 80s. 
And I got, and, and Jim Henson lived not far from um, Langhorn, Pennsylvania, Sesame Place. And uh, his family was there. So I got to, to know his family. And, um, and so, and Jane Henson became a friend of mine. I was, I, I was touring with the Muppet Show on Tour and the Muppet Babies Live. And uh, Jim Henson, um, Jane said, why don't you come in and, and do some work with Jim? So I said, absolutely. So I came in and I started doing some body puppet work for Jim. And he'd say, okay, how does this puppet move? And what do you need inside this, this puppet? Do you need a toggle on the back of the neck? And can you roll over? Does that distort you in there? Can you breathe in there? And so I became kind of a, a go-to for Jim Henson to try out body puppets for, for large puppets on his TV shows and his specials on Sesame Street. And I, and I workshopped a character called uh, Baby Snuffleupagus. And uh, it was really quite an exciting experience. But while we were working, um, they took, uh, he said to me, Paul, I, I have to take away uh, Baby Snuffleupagus from you because I, all the characters on Sesame Street are male. Bert, Ernie, Big Bird, Grover, Cookie Munt, they're all male. He said, and all the puppeteers are male. And he said, I need some diversity. So I'm gonna give this to a female puppeteer and make this a female character. And it broke my heart a little bit because I had worked so hard on it for months and months. And so um, he said, Paul, don't worry. I have another uh, character coming for you and it's with you specifically in mind. And then uh, he died three months later. Oh, my stars. <laughs> and it was the greatest gift he could have given me because um, at first I was upset about it, but then it began to become part of me. And it, to this day, occasionally I'll have a dream and it'll be Jim Henson and this door will open and will say, come on in. And there'll be all these cool puppets and all kind of mechanism things and cameras. And he's like, come on in, here it is. And it's always for me a, a kind of a flag in my life that something new is coming and that um, there's another chance and an opportunity for me to move forward in my life. So one of my greatest teachers was Jim Henson, um, Michael Bennett from, you know, I've learned so much from him, although I only met him a few times auditioning, but I did get to do the show, A Chorus Line, for years. Um, I worked with the people that were so close to him, Bayark Lee and um, Deborah Henry and uh, Tommy Walsh, who was the original Bobby in A Chorus Line. I have his shoes and his hat from the finale in my apartment. And wow. I began to assist them as, as a choreographer and as a dancer, which has been very exciting for me to keep that part of myself alive and not say, okay, I'm not a dancer anymore. I'm now something else. I still teach Pilates. I still teach dance. I teach at Equinox Fitness Clubs in New York City. And I only usually like to work for the best. I like to work. If I'm going to work, I'm going to work at the top. Um, so I want to work, you know, doing my work at, at its best, at, at the best level. So I like working in the big leagues. <laughs> so I have a great following at Equinox for about 26 years. Wow. And they still follow me. I still teach online now. I just started teaching again, which has really been great online. Oh, how wonderful. That's yeah. terrific. I love the idea of, of that, that pivot that I, I'm reinventing myself and doing something a little bit different than I used to. And yet you're still striving. And I love what you just said about the, this idea of collaborative efforts building on one another. You know, it, you, run, you want to work with the best and in, in part that, that helps you become even better. Yes, truly, truly, truly. If I'm going to work and do a play, I'm going to do it on Broadway. I'm going to do it off Broadway if I have to, but I want to work at Playwrights Horizons. I want to work, and I focus my energy on that too, it working. I don't want to do regional theater anymore. I don't want to do small theaters. Not that I don't love that work. I just, I want to focus my energy at going to the top. If that's where I can be, that's where I want to be. Absolutely. And you know, that those goals, that focus, it has helped you get where you are today. And it's, it's one of the things that, that spurs you on. Uh, but yeah. before we go there, I want to, I want to take you back. I want to take you back to young Paul, little okay. Paul and, yeah. and ask you uh, what got you started? Like here you are today with all yeah. of these incredible things going on, but what made you decide that performing or acting or dancing, whatever it was that sparked you first, was it for you? What, what, what started it for you? Well, I knew uh, in 1969 when I first saw Sesame Street and I saw Oscar the Grouch, I knew 
that I was going to be working and doing puppets. I knew that I was going to be a performer. And I just started immersing myself after watching that first episode of Sesame Street. I was in kindergarten. And I remember saying, I want to do this. This is magic to me. And I enjoyed that magic. And so I started doing puppet shows around the house. And I started doing plays in the neighborhood. And it really sparked me to say, this is who I am. My sister was taking dance classes. I said, well, I'm going to be a dancer too then. And um, it was many years later, because my father wouldn't let me take dance classes, that I actually started dance lessons. And by the time I was 13, I had a fifth grade teacher who was uh, an amazing man who was also an actor. And he saw that I, I had this inspiration to be an actor. And uh, we had all gone to Radio City to see the movie 1776 and see the Rockettes. Mm. And I just fell in love with what I saw on that stage and what I saw on that screen and musical theater just became who I was. And so um, I started pursuing that. And, and he said, there's an audition at McCarter Theater in Princeton, New Jersey. I was 12. Or he, he got me into local theater first. I was doing like local community theater in Trenton, New Jersey. And it was really good theater. And then I started working at college theater as a kid still. And then there was this audition when I was 13 for McCarter Theater to do a play with Herschel Bernardi. And I said, you know, I'm going to apply. What the heck? And I got it. And it was uh, called The Confirmation. It was written by Her um, Howard Ashman, who wrote A Little Shop of Horrors. Mm. And, um, and it was directed by um, Ken Frankel. And it was a, and um, Michael Kahn was the producing director. And there I was at, at, at 13 years old doing a professional play at McCarter Theater. My parents are like, where are we driving you tonight? What is this? They weren't theater parents. They weren't, you know, uh, stage parents at all. Right. And there I was working as an actor <laughs> professionally. <laughs> and I wasn't even in high school yet. And so um, it was very exciting. And that was, I knew then that that was my life. And that was what I was going to do. And, and I just started finding creative ways in my life to live. Music is part of who I am. I listen to music. I thank my mother for that. She just always had music around the house. And um, I just knew I had to play the piano. I saw my, my kindergarten teacher said to me one day, that's a piano, don't touch it. So of course you tell me not to, I'm gonna walk up to it. And I touched a key and this magic happened. And I went, oh my gosh, what is that? And then I touched another key and I heard this magic and I just said, I have to have a piano. So. I begged my parents from the time I was five till the time I was 13 to get a piano and they wouldn't. They said, you're going to get bored with it. We're not going to do that. So after I got this play at McCarter Theater, I took the money that I, I uh, made from that play and I bought a piano. And I got piano lessons and music has always been a part of my life. And every day I play the piano as my solace. I don't play professionally. I play for myself. Mm -hmm. I play for my friends and people in my life. And it's just... It just inspires me every day to find music in everything that I do. And as an acting teacher, I'm always saying to, to my students, this is music. What we do as voice actors is music. It's melody, it's tempo, it's rhythm, it's pitch, and it's change of all of those that makes us interesting as a voice actor. So I'm always encouraging actors to find musicality in what they do and not just words, speaking words that have flat musicality but that they have melody that's interesting that sounds like you're in, engaged emotionally in a relationship so that's what always inspires me truly all my oh, life music. that's incredible Mu i love that as a musician myself i'm i'm thinking wow yes we can look at it as a conversation like a fugue or a cantata and yeah. and really it, it, it <laughs> those layers are really quite something how yeah. how we how we speak how we make room for each other you know yeah you can listen to a composer and, and think oh that's kind of cacophonous that's not really but but think about an argument where two people are shouting over each other that can be pretty yeah. cacophonous too so it's fascinating that that you have developed this way of looking at acting and 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 it's body movement also i mean there's so much of it that is musically uh, the touches on music or or is musically oriented. I remember I studied theater movement with Barry Goldman. I don't know if you know who he is, but okay. um, he, yeah, he's, he's great. He's, he's a wonderful man. And he 
we never moved even just walking without music playing in the classroom. Never, <laughs> you know, so there was always, he would always play music and we would have to move to that music. And it wasn't specifically dance. It was, it was movement for actors, but, uh, yeah. but, but music played a huge role there too. So I love that two of these great teachers in my life have, have both found that, that connection. So you know I, that whenever I teach a class, you walk into my room, music is playing, you exit my class, music is playing. It just changes us. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. absolutely, yeah. and I and I always love your playlist. So one of these days, I'm gonna <laughs> I'm gonna like snag all of them so that I can have those. Playlists. They're terrific. Yeah. Uh, so I wanna I wanna ask you something that I wanna get a little philosophical for a second because we're taught we're deep in the in 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 the in the in the depths of of this creative thought process, and I'd love yeah. to know from you, what is acting? What what is an actor? What is acting? What is that to you? What a great question. For me, an actor is someone who can tap into who they are truly, um, love who they are, and allow yourself to create relationship with an audience, uh, be that recorded, be that live, uh, be that on film, and really be present and aware that what you're creating as a performer is a relationship with the audience not just the other actors, but also with the audience. And I go to theater, I feel like the whole experience is not happening on the stage, it's not happening in the audience. It's that space in between the two, that give and take of energy that you have from an audience. It is so magical and so visceral, you feel it. And when I went to see the play Hamilton recently, it was extraordinary because the audience was so excited to be there the cast, some of them were doing, they were brand new cast, some of them. And it was just this exchange of love and joy that came back and forth between the two that made that evening such a magnificent masterpiece. And I feel like a chorus line did that. And I felt that when I was doing the chorus line and I did it for, you know, 10, 15 years, I was in a chorus line all over the world. And it's this exchange that you get with an audience. I also got to work at Second City in Chicago. I had auditioned for uh, Lauren Michaels and Saturday Night Live in the late 80s. And um, I, it was a wonderful experience going through that audition. But he said to me, you need some more improv uh, technique behind you. So in the early 90s, after I had finished a tour of A Chorus Line, I, I packed my car without a job, without an apartment, and I moved to Chicago. Um, I had a few hundred dollars. and. That day I found an apartment and within a few days I had an audition for um, the Second City Touring Company and I got to work in the school a bit. And that changed me as an actor, that experience of finding improv and being spontaneous in the moment. That's what's exciting. For me, listening to an audiobook and hearing that actor perform that text as though they're making it up in this moment, as though they're the, the voice of the author's pen speaking through that text in that moment, it's, it's magical to hear an actor do that. And for me, acting is, is creating magic. It's creating that sense of, this is happening right now just for you. And that's exactly what we're doing right now. <laughs> Absolutely. And and I love what you say in class. And, and for all of you listening, I have taken so far as many acting classes as I could with Paul. As, <laughs> and, and I have more signed up when when uh, when they are offered again. I, I, I'm signed up for all the rest. Uh, and one of the things that I love that you say is that sense of discovery, discovering the text, discovering the situation, discovering your role and your relationship to it. Can you talk a little bit about what that means to you, that sense of discovering the role as well as the text as well as the character sure well it's interesting because you know the text you've read the text you know what's going to happen the audience does not and so what you want to do i'd love to play in memory and i often say to actors do this as a memory like you're trying to recall something and i begin to read the text as though i'm recalling it and it creates this magical moment of this is happening right now for me this is not somebody reading a script. This is somebody thinking these thoughts. And I really believe that this character is really exists and is creating these thoughts in this moment. And that is our job as actors is to take someone else's text and bring it to life as your own thoughts, your, as your own thought process, as your own 
uh, imagination. And I love that you didn't call me a voice acting teacher, you call me an acting teacher. Um, because I consider myself an acting teacher and it just so happens that I teach voice acting mostly these days. And I really find that um, by approaching it to teach an actor to find themselves head, heart and body is so important because most actors, they'll learn their lines, they learn their motivation and they say, okay, I'm ready. And that's your head. And most actors stop there, but you've got to now go down and personalize this text. Who does this make me think of? Where am I? What am I smelling? What am I hearing? What's happening in this moment? And when you do a commercial copy or you do a script or a narration script or um, e-learning from that place, who am I teaching? Who am I talking to specifically in my life? Once I personalize that work, it's untouchable. You can direct an actor around it, but it's so specific to that actor in that moment, it's, it's magic. And that's what acting is for me. It's creating magical moments of, of life, of being present in this moment, truly. And that right there, that bit of gold that you just dropped is, <laughs> no, seriously, here's, here's, here's my own personal, you know, the testimonial for the great Paul Liberti. So <laughs> I started, you know, I do, I, I do voiceovers myself and voice acting and, um, and I've started incorporating that into every audition, especially interestingly, the e-learning ones. And it has changed how many bookings I get like crazy. I so, love it. I so, love it. so your, 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 your teaching works, Paul, your teaching <laughs> works. <laughs> One of my favorite things to tell you, say to an actor is, and, and I want you to say this phrase, say, I'm so nervous. I'm so nervous. I'm so nervous. Say that. I'm so nervous. Now I want you to substitute that word nervous for excited. I'm so excited. Say it differently. I'm so excited. You feel your body change. And, I I, I, and it did change. <laughs> it's what we feed our minds is the truth. When you say the words, I am, what you put after those two words is the truth for us. I'm so scared. I'm nervous. I'm upset. Then you are. And your brain feeds that and goes, okay, he's upset. So we got to dump some adrenaline in him. But if I say, I'm so excited. Oh, I'm so comforted your body and your mind responds to that. And that's really important as actors that we understand that. Um, that because when you're an actor and you're lying and you're not really coming from a place of truth, we know it and we hear it right away. So it's important that you're coming from a place of honesty of saying, this is who I am. I love who I am. And I'm so happy to be doing this work. It's so simple and I love this. And the, those are the words. Those are the Paul Liberty <laughs> words. It, it, and it's and it's true. I you should you should hear how many times or see how many times I go back into my auditions and remove. This is so simple. I love this <laughs> from <laughs> from the recordings because yeah. because and yes, I did shake my head as you, as I did that uh, because that's to me that's so important to to have that. But something you said and something I want to touch on is the idea of knowing yourself and loving yourself uh -huh. as an actor. Uh, that that means that there's there needs to be some uh, some level of of uh, self knowledge and and really I'm going to just go there and say it and mental health in order yeah. to be able to fully immerse yourself in this really it's magical work and it's healing work and and i know that you you've mentioned before in class see i've got the inside scoop here a little bit you've mentioned before in in class how there have been times when you've been working with actors and you've said you know i'm not sure you're ready yet to be an actor because i think you need to do some personal growth and oh, how sure. how how is that for you when you realize that an actor is either too scared or too nervous or doesn't know themselves well enough to, to, to really go into the depths of doing this work? First of all, how do you recognize that? And, and then what do you do to help them get to that place? It's, it's, it's interesting because many actors are, should be there, but there's been a few times in my life as a teacher when I've had an actor come in who's a very talented actor but they have so much chaos and stuff that they haven't dealt with. Mm -hmm. So when I talk to them about, you know, who do you love and, and who are you thinking about right now? And they'll turn to me and say, I, I, I'm not thinking of anyone because I don't love anybody. Wow. And then I'll, yeah. And I'll have them say that. And I'll say, 
okay. So, uh, you know, I'll say later privately to them, we need to do some work here because relationships are about kindness. They're about uh, compromise and they're about love. And it's important that you are able to have a relationship. And if you haven't healed a lot of the relationships in your life, many, for many of us, that goes back to our parents and our families. If you haven't dealt with those, then going into the work as an actor is going to play a mind game on you. When you get casting directors saying things to you that are negative or you, you perceive them as negative, it's going to hurt you. And going through the audition process can be a daunting one for somebody who's healthy mentally. But if you're unhealthy, you're going to strike out at your agent. You're going to be angry. Why didn't I book this? This is not fair. And how do you do it? You have to be able to reconcile the relationships in your life first. And then you're available to help someone else. It's like being on an airplane when they say the mask will come down, but you've got to put it on yourself first before you can put it on your child. The same thing is true, I think, in life. You've got to be able to take care of yourself so that you can take care of others. Otherwise, you're, you're not able to help anybody, truly. Absolutely. And, and I remember in class, you asked the question that has made me really think, who are you trying to heal with this text, with this copy, with these words? And <laughs> that, that to me is so powerful. How do you, how do you, how do you approach that, that frame, frame of mind, I guess, of, of healing as an actor? Well, it's interesting because most voiceover coaches would look at me cross-eyed if they heard someone say that. Um, and it's, it's interesting that um, I think as commercial actors, we're talking about headaches and heartaches and financial woes. We are healers as commercial actors. We have to see ourselves that way. And I often say, who in your life are you healing? Who does this script make you think of? You know, it's about a bank, but you know, it's really about my sister. I remember when I was trying to get my car and she needed this from me. And, I, and so when you say your sister's name and you see her eyes and you go into that text, there's a healing quality that happens between that relationship between you and your sister or whoever it is you choose, but also inside yourself. And it's, it's, it's a beautiful experience to hear an actor do that. I think that's why we give Oscars and Emmys and Tony Awards to actors because they tap into that. And voice actors tend to go with the sound of their voice. Here's how I sound. That's not interesting. No one cares how you sound. We care how you connect to the listener. Right. And um, when I started teaching audiobook narration, and I work for Audible, and I work for um, Author Direct Audio, directing authors in their audiobooks, I started to, to ask them, who are you reading the book to? And, they, and my narrators would say, oh, that's an interesting question. Well, who would you read the story to? Who would be interested in hearing the story in your life? Say their name, see their eyes, talk to them. And make them pull back a little bit because it's the author's story, not their own, but they are still present. And then I ask them, who are you healing telling this story? Mm -hmm. Because every book you've ever read and every story you've ever read, every movie you've ever loved and watched more than once has healed you in some way. It's, it's allowed you to be who you are. Um, and you identify yourself in that storytelling. So I think healing is a part of, of all of our work as actors. I know as comedians, like your husband, the work he does is healing to make someone laugh. I mean, there's nothing more healing than, than laughter um, or to make someone touch their heart or make them feel or make them feel a sense of joy or, or you know, even sorrow. It just is it's, it's very healing for us to do that. Now, if I'm not a healthy person mentally and I begin to tap into that, it's going to hurt me. So I have to make sure that as an actor, I'm ready to do that. And I am in a space where I feel healthy enough that I can play characters that might say things I wouldn't say. Or I can, I can play an evil character who might do something that is, um, that, is, that is evil, that is mean, that is maybe not a healthy thing for that character to do. But for me as a person, I have to understand where that character is coming from. That character doesn't think of them as evil. He thinks of himself as the hero. He's writing a wrong in his thought. And rather than thinking that, oh, this is a mean, angry, evil person, I play it from a place of this is someone who's hurting. This is someone who's misguided. And they're lost in their misguidedness. And so as a healthy actor, mentally, I'm able to do that. And I think my actors need to be that as well. 
I love everything you just said. And I have <laughs> so many questions. It, yeah. It's actually interesting because you mentioned Rich, my husband, and one of the things that he has done over the years, he's a clown and a comedian, and he's done hospital clowning where they go in to the, to the pediatric oncology ward and they work and at entertaining these kids, you know, so that they yeah. bring laughter and smiles to people who are otherwise really hurting and suffering. So this idea of healing through comedy, through acting, through performing, it's, it's visceral. It comes, it comes through so brilliantly. And, you know, he talks about how he had to create his clown character over decades. It didn't come easily as far as really fleshing it out and developing it so that he could be mature enough to do it. And I wanted to talk with you about that idea of creating a character for a role, for the commercial. I'd love to talk about what your process is for creating a character. It could be an animation character or okay. a character on stage. What yeah. do you do and how could you, and this is the big one, how could you apply that process, that method to regular life? Oh, that's wonderful. What, a, what great questions. So for me, the process of creating an animated character, as I begin that process, um, I, there's three things that have to happen. Uh, the first thing is I must anchor that character. If I, I have to base that energy on someone, some entity, it could be a couple different energies. It could be my nephew, it could be my niece, it could be another actor. Um, it could be an amalgam of a couple different ideas. Um, and I usually start from anchoring that character to, um, to someone or something, someone is best for me. And then I must change, um, so if I'm gonna play a character, if I have to change placements, so I go into different placements, wherever they are, yeah, so I can, <laughs> I can actually uh, let me sound different than I actually sound. And, and, and by putting on different accents, I can sound like another person who thinks very differently than I do. And I must change placements, uh, which sometimes can mean, mean changing accents as well, but where that sound appears to be coming from. I can come up here from, from just between my eyes and I feel it up here. Oh, it's down in that lower part of my chest or my gut. Um, and the other thing that has to happen for me as an actor is I must change uh, energies. And energies for me is, um, we have three different energies. One of them is a kinetic energy, which is I'm doing what I'm doing right now. We equate with the physical. But an internal energy is where I lower the volume and I ramp the intensity. And it becomes an internal thought. But I'm speaking externally, but it's internal. So I might start a script external and then go into an internal thought, then go back to external, then internal. And it draws you into that performance in animation, in voiceover, in commercial work, in audiobooks, especially with audiobook narrators, because it's such long text. If I just talk like this for the entire book, it's, it's dreadful. But occasionally, the volume isn't that much difference. But if I begin to think the text, To Kill a Mockingbird by Harper Lee is different than To Kill a Mockingbird by Harper Lee. It's, it, you think the thought and you go in into internal energy and an external energy. And the, by changing those energies, it, be, it brings you into a, a performance so quickly and that my process as a voice actor has sharpened me as an actor on camera, on stage, um, to work faster, to get to that character. Uh, because as voice actors, we have to. We have very little time to rehearse. Often as a, a video game actor, I'm given a script and reading it, reading the lines for the first time as I'm saying them. Um, they don't allow me to see them because of social media. People tweet out the scripts. So we have to be able to do that process while we're, while we're seeing those lines for the first time. Uh, while we're doing ADR, I'm also uh, six voices on Pokemon. Um, I was one of the original cast. Um, when you're seeing those lines, you're also thinking in your mind, how do I match this lip flap? And, okay, and I've got to now, okay, got to watch the screen and I'm getting this line for the first time and I'm going into character. There's so much to think about. You're hearing beats in your head where you begin to speak. Um, and ADR is a little tricky, so you're replacing the dialogue is what ADR is. And you want to um, still stay present in those thoughts and still change energies, still uh, anchor that character so it doesn't drift away. You don't just start in a Southern accent because that's gonna just kind of fade away. But if I base my accent on my uncle, Uncle Tibby, 
you know, because I can hear him in my head. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So that accent's going to stick. It's not going to drift away. And it's, it's important that you really anchor, change your energies, change your placement. Even if it's just brightening that sound forward in your mouth. Those three things have to happen for me as a, as a voice actor and as an actor. Wow, that was a masterclass in <laughs> acting in three minutes. That was amazing. Uh, and and so to get to the second part of that, and I love what you said about changing energies and going from internal, external, and external to internal. What I've noticed as I'm as I'm practicing it more and more, because I have a feeling this is something I'm going to be practicing uh, for the rest of my life, not just as a as an actor, but as a professional speaker and yeah. as a and a teacher. What's interesting about about that internal external energy is that is is what causes the shift and how well you have to know yourself to 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 shift from internal external or external to internal something has to change in your mindset in your body in your heart what do you attribute that to when you're when you're deep in a character and you're making that happen what is happening to make that shift occur I invite people in my life into my work. So as I'm working, I specifically know that this is, I'm speaking, you know, when you say to an actor, uh, who are you talking to? A lot of voiceover coaches, who are you talking to? Well, you can't put somebody's face in front of your face and talk to them because we don't talk to somebody that way. But all I have to do is say somebody's name. I can say my mother's first name or my father or even my cat, you know? And, and it brings a, a, an energy and a joy to you that opens you up in a different way. So it's a matter of just, who am I speaking about in this scene? Mm -hmm. And just say their name, see their eyes. And it brings you to a new place of, of energy that's just infinitely interesting. And that's what makes an actor interesting. And, and what's fascinating about what you just said is that it's immediate. It seems like yeah. it's, it, it is right in front of you. So yeah. if I were going to ask you the second part of my very long ago question, how would you apply that to real life? How would you apply that to your life and to, to the life of an accountant or a lawyer or a teacher? Oh, I love that. Well, it's interesting because I tell my actors, you're an actor 24 hours a day. You're an actor when you wake up, you're an actor when you go to sleep. And everything you do living a creative life feeds your creativity. You're always being inspired. I look at a sunset. I look at a, a color. I look at a you know, and I'm, I'm already imagining what that is to me and absorbing that into me and making that part of my process as a performer and as a creative thinker, as a writer, as a dancer, as a musician. And I'm inspired by what I see and the nature that I find. I find that the closer I get to, to nature, the more I can absorb um, into myself um, true and honest uh, inspiration for what I do. And um, I think um, one of my favorite words is the word empathy. And it's often that um, I see people and I begin to empathize with them. And sometimes I know that this person might not be healed. And if I, they bumped into me and I turn at them and I might want to yell at them, I have to understand that where they're coming from is not the same place I'm coming from. Sure. So I have to see the people around me as people in their own process, people in their own sense of spiritual development. And some of them are not as evolved as others might be and mm -hmm. might not even be as evolved, as evolved as I am. And so being an actor has allowed me to, to see that, to, to really have empathy for people in my life, people around me, and to be inspired by everybody I meet and everybody I see and listening to their accent. I'm being inspired by their thought process, and it feeds me to, to want to help them in some ways by helping to absorb their thought process into my own when I'm creating character. So um, it's all a healing process, truly. I think it is. And it's also a connection process. You know, it's a way for us to connect, even if we're not actively, hello, how are you -ing to people? Yeah. It's it's a way of connecting with the other beings that share the planet. And it's 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 interesting. I call myself a shameless eavesdropper 
<laughs> which I which I am. I I'm a not only a people watcher, but I am blessed with a really good memory, so I can remember entire conversations. And when I'm out and about, yeah. and I'm I I actually have I'm going to be publishing a book called Overheard, of all the crazy, amazing, inspiring, ridiculous things. I've overheard while wandering the streets of New York and before that the streets of Washington DC because because these are these are other people's lives that we get to touch so briefly and we don't you don't know their story but boy is it fascinating to see to have the the curtain pulled back just a little cuz okay. I do believe you know we're all storytellers so so every character, every person has their own story. And like you said, they are the hero of their own story. So if you're developing a character, how do you develop the story of that character for yourself or someone you're teaching? How do you help them find that, that sort of that arc, if you will, of the journey they're going to go on? We play the game, what if? And we, we play the game of, you know, who, who does the script make you think of? And well, what if you were this? And what if you had to do that? And they, it begins to open the actor up to say, okay, well, I can, I can be that. And we begin simply by just asking ourselves questions about this character and, and you know, how do I see myself in this place? And it's, some, it's funny, I've been cast in roles where I go, how do they ever see me as this? I, I can't find myself in this role at all. And within a few weeks, I'm going, this was written for me, <laughs> you know, and it's, you just have to continually find yourself in the work because anybody can play any role. We are all one. We all identify with each other because we're all connected. Um, and it's, it's just really interesting that you must really find yourself within everybody you're asked to play. Even if it's just an audition that is in those moments, that role is yours. When you're auditioning, our work as actors is auditioning every day. It's funny because my, I had to let my family understand that in their lives, when you're looking for work, you're unemployed. Mm. But when you're an actor and you're auditioning, you're looking for work, that is our work. Our, right. our job as actors is to look for work every day. And you have to allow the people in your life to understand that. Otherwise, they think you're a bum. You know, <laughs> well, you're, you're, you're never working. You know, what's wrong with you? You're always auditioning. That's all you do. You know, and you have to explain to them and help them understand how it is you see life and how it is you live a creative life. Because it is different than, than the average person who goes to a financial job and works with numbers all day and then comes home and, you know, goes to sleep and wakes up, looks at their phone, eats food, goes back. We as creative thinkers and as creatives, li creative livers have to introspect quite often. And we have to look inside ourselves and look inside others. And sometimes we're surprised at what we see. And what we find there can also be very rewarding as well, truly. Absolutely. Right now, right now we're all um, isolated um, in time and, and, and place right now. But I feel like we're all alone, apart, and together at the same time. I feel connected to so many people in so many ways because we might be apart right now, but we're also together too, which I love. And you know, what's really amazing to me about what you just said, it's, it's the collaborations that I'm seeing sort of strike up that I did not, that I never expected. People are doing incredible work together, even though we're all in our apartments or houses or whatever, yeah. where people are reaching out to one another and getting inspired by one another and building on top of what other people are building to create incredible art. I it's at a that. distance, but it's still happening. It's incredible. Last night I did a guided meditation uh, based on Louise Hay teachings. Mm -hmm. and it, was, um, it was so beautiful to have, to be able to do those meditations and affirmations. And I would never think of myself doing that. I'd never. And if this hadn't happened, I probably would not have. But it was such a healing thing for all of us that went through it together. I'm going to do it again. <laughs> oh, I'm so glad. Yeah. Every Yay. Sunday. Yeah. I yeah. couldn't make it last night because I was doing my own thing, but uh, uh, I'm going to definitely try next week. Uh, so, so I want to ask you something about this idea of creative life. How it sounds to me like you've already answered the question, but I want to see if there's anything else yeah. that we can talk about with that before we move on to the rest of the many questions I still have. Uh, okay. So, so how has your creative life informed 
your regular life? How do you view going shopping for food? And how is that? Do you know what I mean? Because, because I'm very drawn, for example, when I go shopping for, let's say, fruits, I can't just buy whatever fruit. I have to, I have to look at what, what looks the best as far as the colors. Are they vivid yeah. and bright? Do they, does the fruit has a, have a, a scent and aroma that I'm, that I'm captivated by? That's kind of how I pick my produce. It takes me a while, I promise. But, <laughs> but still, I, I, I end up lingering over things like that. And really, you know, just like being captivated by a sunset, a, a good produce display will fascinate me for some time. Do you find that that sort of thing happens to you? And if so, how? Oh, absolutely. And in, in very much the same way. Um, I, I love, well, food is, is a wonderful gift to us. And I love making a meal. I love, especially if I'm making it for someone I love and people I love, is making a you know, wonderful um, soup or a wonderful uh, gazpacho or, you know, and really mm. enjoying picking out the tomatoes and, and picking out the cilantro and, and the smells. We, we've been growing um, uh, basil, fresh basil Ooh. on our windowsill. Oh my gosh. <laughs> it's the best. You haven't lived until you've had fresh herbs, yeah. uh, you know, and, and tarragon and fresh uh, rosemary growing in your, in your apartment. And then to be able to use that in food you're cooking, it's, it's pouring love into, into what you're doing. Absolutely. I, I grow my own basil out, uh, out in my apartment too. And in the summertime when I go, oh, I want, I want pesto tonight, just being able to go and snip yeah. the leaves off and put it oh. in the, pe- oh, it's incredible. Just yeah. incredible. Uh, yeah. So, so within that framework, when you are, when you are working to cook for people you love to, to sort of present a, a good solid meal, what, what inspires you to do it? Is it just because it's food and you want to share it? Or is there a deeper meaning that, because I, I have a, I have a thing that you, again, I, I keep coming back to class, but it was such a wealth of experience for me. One of the, one of the greatest gifts you gave me as a, as a teacher is the, the physical motion of bringing your hands towards your heart and then giving with your hands towards who you're talking to. And that motion of giving has, has informed pretty much everything I'm doing now. But, but that idea, it actually is like presenting a, a beautiful gazpacho or, or a beautiful, I don't know, spaghetti and marinara sauce or something that you have created yourself to someone you love. That feeling of sharing really pervades what I see as your work. How do you, does that characterize what you, what you're it's doing? How do you feel about that? <laughs> Maybe it's being Italian. I don't know, but, um, but I always am saying to actors to give of yourself, open mm-hmm. your heart and let it flow. And many actors hold back and they're afraid to give of themselves because they feel that if, if they give everything, they'll, they won't have anything left for themselves. Mm-hmm. And just the opposite is true. The more you give and the more love that you give out, the stronger you are. And that's true with the people that were your guardians in life, whoever your parents were, or whoever took care of you growing up. Think back to all that they did for you. It didn't make them weaker in your eyes. It made them stronger. And I think as people, the more we give, the stronger we are. And I love to make great food for my friends and family because, and I'm, um, I, I dare say I'm vegetarian and, and, and I'm often vegan, but I really love that um, I'm, fruits and vegetables just make you mm. feel so good and nuts and seeds and having a handful of, of raw almonds just you feel so good by eating great food so I love finding creative ways to make food I love taste even better by mixing them together ah oh, that's fabulous yay <laughs> I'm coming to your house <laughs> oh please, please. this is all over you're coming over absolutely so so i yeah and 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 if you're willing to make the trek to brooklyn we'll have you uh absolutely. over <laughs> yeah. uh, i also go to people's kitchens and just start cooking oh i you are absolutely welcome so <laughs> you know because and there will be plenty of fresh fruit and vegetables in the house since we're both rich and i are both vegans so oh. so i want to ask you something i want to switch tracks just a little bit and there's, again, I'm so grateful that you are giving so much of your time and your energy to this because I have so many questions and you're, you know, we'll be done by tomorrow. No, I, I hopefully <laughs> not, not, not quite that long. So, so when you're, when you're, when you're preparing, when you're doing 
food or, or uh, you know, a role that you're acting or even, or I know you're doing voice directing now, which I think is so fabulous. Directing, directing other people to do their characters, to create their characters, something in you must have shifted at some point to make that happen, to make you go, okay, I'm a performer, absolutely, and yet I have this other love, which is directing. What was the influence around that? And, and in fact, what was your, who are your biggest influences? I'd love to know that. Who, yeah. who has influenced you in, in the shifts that you're making and also in the life that you're living? Wow, it's interesting. Um, um, uh, I'm writing notes here. Um, it's interesting <laughs> because, um, um, one more time, the question. <laughs> so the question is, is my inspiration. Yeah. Well, the influence. Who who influences you in in your creative life? Who are your influences? And also, what influenced your the shit that you've you've had shifts uh, in your life as a yeah. as a dancer, as a yeah. as a puppeteer, as an actor? You've you've you're what what multifaceted i will say as a as a creative being and i think a lot of people are afraid to be multifaceted as yeah. creatives or or whatever they they do with their lives even though i think we're all creative but something something sparks that that feeling to to be free to make those shifts and i'd love it if yeah. you could talk a little bit about that absolutely i think one of the one of two of the greatest teachers in my life were two of the most creative people I know, two of the funniest people I know, my parents. Um, my father uh, used to build airplanes. Um, wow. He's still alive. He's 92. And um, he would build them in our garage. He'd build them in our basement. You'd come home and there'd be a wing. In the <laughs> there'd be a, a tail of an airplane sticking out the back of the, the garage. And when we'd come home and we'd look at the newspaper, he'd have drawn airplanes on the newspaper. So you couldn't read the article and wow. you just drew an airplane on it. My mom illustrated children's books and she uh, was an artist and did a lot of the, uh, for Crane Publishing, a lot of the, the books that I grew up with in, in school that we all grew up with. Uh, a lot of the illustrations, you pencil sketches you saw were done by my mom. Wow. And, um, and so they inspired me to really... Um, be a creative person always. My mother was always painting things. She was always doing crafty things around the house. And so when you come into my home, you see Muppet things and you see creative things around because it, it just inspires me every day to be, um, to be creative in everything that I do. If you go to my Facebook page, I don't just put pictures up of me eating meals. I try and inspire people on my, on my wall. I try to do Everything I do, I want to entertain and, and inspire others in what I do, rather than just say, look at me, you know? One of my favorite um, voice directors is uh, Brad Bird. I just- oh, uh, I love Brad Bird. Oh, I've learned so much from him. And I really um, want to do more voice direction. I have worked in LA and I've worked in New York and I've worked around the country for SAG After Foundation. Um, and I've taught hundreds of actors in audiobook narration and commercial work and in uh, character building for, um, for for animation and it just it's exciting to watch any actor i can work with any actor you give me and they're magnificent if you allow them to be and if you allow them to find themselves in the work that they do extraordinary work comes out of any actor and any actor in my opinion can be a star and a celebrity because once you tap into who you are it's it's interesting and it's it's fascinating to see someone accept who they are and bring that to the table. It's when an actor hides that, that it becomes more difficult to see that performance. You go, well, that was, that was good. <laughs> it's, it's guarded and it's right. not open hearted. And right. truth, the, the secret to it all is love. I was auditioning, believe it or not, this is strange. If um, I worked with, when I worked with the Muppets, um, Jim Henson died in 1990. They auditioned a few of us to replace him. It was pretty obvious that, that the gentleman that did get it at the time was going to get it because he was so close to him. But they did audition a few of us and um, I would have loved to play that character. And I really understood, uh, hi-ho, Kermit the Frog here. Uh, you're fired, Piggy. I really would have loved to have played that character. Um, but um, it was a mm -hmm. character that I loved. Mm -hmm. I was also in the, in the 90s, late 90s, asked to replace another character, which was the character of Barney, which I didn't quite relate to because it was not, an adult character. Mm -hmm. 
But when I auditioned for it, they said, there's something about you that intrigues us. We love your audition. And there were three people, one from California, one from Colorado, and myself that were flown down to Dallas and were considered to replace that, that character. And they said, what's missing from your performance is love. And, uh, you know, a lot of the actors that auditioned, they had that, you know, uh, that sense of, what does Barney say? Barney, um, <laughs> hello again to all my friends. And they, they would imitate the way he sounded, mm -hmm. but they didn't have that real sense of sharing. Mm -hmm. And that really spoke to me because when you put love into the work and you say, I love you, you know, you really mean what you're saying. And love really is present because you've personalized that into someone you really do love and visualize in front of you. Then that's untouchable that's when you create magic as a performer and as an audience. It's magic to watch an actor do that because you feel that love present and that joy present in their work, truly. And you know what's fascinating about what you, what you just said, that, that feeling of magic, it stays, it stays with you as, a, as an audience member. And I'm a complete stage show and movie dork. You know, I, <laughs> I have thousands of movies and have watched them all multiple times and, uh, and love musical theater more than just about anything. But, but, but there are certain performances, certain things that stay with you and, and really change. It changed my life. And it's interesting that you brought up Brad Bird because he plays Edna Mode in the Incredibles. Mm -hmm. And uh, Edna is, uh, I have a little, I have a little uh, action figure of Edna that I'm looking at right now in my office because she is such an influence on my life. When I, this is going to sound a little ridiculous, but I'm going to have to tell you this quick little story. That performance in, in, in infected me. It didn't just Im impact me. It infected me so much that uh, I, I have a little librarian who lives in my head and her name is Edna and she looks suspiciously like Edna Mode. And she is the person, the character that I have developed who is my librarian. She keeps track of all the things that I would otherwise forget. If I need to remember something, I don't rack my brain anymore to try and remember it. I ask Edna, who lives inside my subconscious, to bring it to me. And I say, Edna, can you remember who played such and such <laughs> character in such and such movie from 1934 and then i stopped thinking about it and sure enough within five minutes i remember because edna brings it to me so so his his character you know he wrote the movie too but his character and the way he did her impacted me to the to the point that now she lives inside my head so <laughs> so so it's really true as an audience member you can have that exchange happen to such a great extent that it that it changes you and it can change both of you i think as the as the performer and as the audience uh, to to the point where nothing is ever the same again yeah, yeah. It's, it's interesting incredible. brad brad birdhead was doing the the film the incredibles and um, he kept auditioning women to play Edna and he couldn't find anybody to play it. Mm -hmm. So he, somebody said, why don't you just play it? Cause he kept doing it for them saying, this is kind of what I want. And so he, once he embraced being the performer, he suddenly, that role just blossomed. And here he was a director wanting to direct animation and cr be creative on that end of it, but also was performing. And he is a wonderful performer too. So. Mm -hmm. Also, remember um, Iron Giant. Absolutely. Oh, what a what a great inspirational uh, piece of of animation. It's a wonderful film. If you're looking for something to see again and again, that's a wonderful film to watch. And it's also his first. And it it is terrific. It it makes me cry several yes. times during that movie. It really yeah. does. Yeah, it's so so I want to ask you as as a creative as a performer, if you if you could do any artistic project right now, if you could take on anything, what would it be? And also, if you could talk about what you have coming up that you can talk about, I would love to know more about what your aspirations are. Oh, that's interesting. As a performer, um, I love doing video game work. I love doing animation. Um, and I love, I really love working uh, out of LA because some of the, the work that comes out of there is different than what we get in New York City. Um, I, I would love, I love playing dark characters. Um, uh, you know, I got a chance to work with the Transformers and to play some of those really big, loud characters. 
and when you will learn to really work great mic technique, you can do anything. Wow. And you can create this illusion that you're this big, giant, giant stone. <laughs> and, uh, and it's, um, I, I, if I could, I would work in doing animation and commercial work all day long. That was what I did for years. And then when it was a shift in union usage of, of commercials, it, it kind of changed for me a little bit. But I still love doing that work so much. Uh-huh. Um, Working on camera is a little less interesting to me because you have less control over your performance. A lot of what you do gets edited out. Mm-hmm. I'm a Stepford husband in the movie, The Stepford Wives. And my scene was kind of cut way down. And I had a moment where I, I was a big entrance scene and, and uh, it was all cut down. But, um, but you know, being a, um, a stage performer, I would love to do more stage work. That's exciting. Mm-hmm. But for me, I really love the process, love the process of working with actors. I just really, it's so exciting to me to see an actor understand a role and grab the reins of a role and take charge of it. Going from, I don't know what to do with this to suddenly going, I have this, I know where I'm going. And it can happen so quickly. As long as you help an actor open up, that process is exciting to me. Doing voice direction and animation is really my goal. Um, and I really love doing it, but also working with actors in class. I just, I have always, as a dancer, even when I was doing chorus work, I was always the dance captain. I was always watching everybody else and learning everybody else's parts. And the director would say, well, he's got to be the dance captain. He's got to be the equity deputy because he's learning everything because I want to, I want to work with dancers. I want to work with actors. I want to see them do the best work they can do. That excites me. And I love that process of helping them do that. I love that you love it because so many of us have learned from you because of, (laughs) no, because you're such a giving teacher. And, and I want to, I want to actually shift focus yet again, because we're going to do a few more questions and then, and then I know you have a life to live. So uh, how, how do you prepare? When you're ready to teach or when you're ready to perform, what's your process of preparing physically, mentally, spiritually to to go out there and do the work? Well, this is a bit of a secret. Most people that take class with me don't realize that before I teach any class, be it a Pilates class, be it a dance class um, or, or an acting class, I actually do some meditation before I begin. And I actually work from uh, my favorite is Julia Cameron. She wrote The Artist's Way. Love that book. And she also wrote a beautiful book, which you're going to love too, called Prayers to the Great Creator. And it speaks to the the creative God within us all. It doesn't speak of any religion specifically. And it has wonderful quotes and it has wonderful, uh, you know, a paragraph of something to meditate on and Mm -hmm. to think about. And I live in, in New Jersey, and I take a 15-minute bus ride into the city before I teach. And on my way in, I usually open my Kindle, and I usually read a page or two of, of Julia Cameron, and I allow myself to remember that I'm a vessel, believe it or not, of God, and that I'm a vessel of a divine source, whatever that is, mm-hmm. and that I need to be present in that class for my students and not to bring my issues of the day and not to bring my stuff into the room and dump that on the students. That would be unfair. I want to be present for those actors there. There are times when I've been late to a class or something's happened and I'm always, my mind goes into chaos and I've got to unwind from that quickly because otherwise I bring that into the room and it's not fair. So it's important that I'm always available and open to any student I'm teaching. And I have to remind myself, this is not my class. I'm not here for me. I'm here for the students. It is their class. Mm. I find that's true with yoga. I find that's true with, with any fitness class or dance class. If the teacher's there to watch themselves in the mirror, it's, it's a really empty experience. But if they're there to really see the students grow and learn and get excited by that, one of my favorite teachers was a, a gentleman named um, Luigi, and he was one of my first dance teachers. And he got so excited watching us all take his movement and making it our own. And he'd go, yeah, come on, give me more. This is beautiful. And he would teach us as dancers to work from the inside out, not from the outside in. So it was always, what am I saying here? I'm going to make a step. I drop my head. I lift my eyes. Say something with your eyes. And he'd do that as a dancer in a combination. Mm. And that changed me as a performer to really think that everything is internalized first and then we externalize the internal. 
as a dancer, as a musician, as an actor, if you don't include that internalization, it's pretty empty work. And it's just flat. It's just lines and it's just thoughts rather than feelings. Because that's what we tap into as performers, as people. It's feelings. Absolutely. And it's and it's presence. You know, it's being immediate, being present as if it's never happened before. And it's discovery from both you and the person you're speaking with yes. or performing for, which I, mm -hmm. which I just love. And, and you know what I find, I, because yes, I did warm up before this chat that we're having. I, I, because I do that before any, any kind of interaction. I, I also meditate and I say a little prayer that I will be of service, essentially, that I will help the person or people that I'm going to be interacting with in some way. That's my, that's my goal in, in whatever it is I'm doing. And so when you do that, when you're, when you're in that, in that place of, of wanting to be of service, I, I would love to know from you, what are you, what are you connecting to? I know you, you mentioned that there's a prayer to, to God or to a more divine, divine being, if you will, and Julia Cameron, whose work I love, and I still do yeah. morning pages every single day and have been since 1997. Wow. Uh, yeah, so it's, it's, it's what allowed me to write six books, you know? Oh, <laughs> it's wonderful. It's, it's, cha it's changed my life. So are you drawing on anything or do you really believe that you're more channeling as you move through your, you know, your teaching and coaching and your performing and also, and don't think I've forgotten you mentioned music because I want to talk more about <laughs> that too. Uh, what, what is happening in that present moment for you? Are you thinking about the technique or are you just so well versed in the technique now that you can be vulnerable and let it just flow? Yes, the technique has to fall away. The uh, same thing I would tell to a dancer. Being able to point your foot is, is important. Being able to hit passe is important. But it gets to a point where you have to let go of that and just dance and just move and just let your process be part of who you are. Um, yeah, and it's, um, and it's, it's just tapping into, um, you know, uh, I, I think I tap into everybody in my life that inspires me. Mm. Uh, and I have so many in extraordinary people in my life. And I feel inspired by every single one of them. And I feel like when I take a journey, I don't ever do it alone. I do it with those that love me. And I feel such love and support from everybody in my life because they express it, because I allow them to. I ask them to. I, I ask them you know, to, to be a part of my life and I invite them in. And it can be vulnerable too but it's also very rewarding to open your heart and to invite people into that heart. Um, and I think it's, it's what a creative does. And I think that's what we express is creatively. We express love. We express our heart and our divine presence within us because it's within everyone. And I think the more you seek a divine presence in everybody you see, mm. the more you find it within yourself. And the more life is satisfying and the work you do is satisfying to feel that we're all guided by some other force beyond ourselves. And that began out in the universe somewhere. And we're all connected to that big bang that happened. We're all part of that explosion. We're all, we were all in there and we, everything around us was in that big bang and everything you see, everything you touch, everyone, you know, we're all part of that energy. And it's all connecting all of us. And that's what we tap into all the time. People call it God. People call it many names. Um, but it's all, it's all there. Science, is, it, it's in science. It's not just spiritual. It's, it's all part of, of the connection of all of us. It absolutely is. And, and yet that vulnerability can be, it's daunting, you know, yeah. to, to, yeah. to, to take that first step. So if, if, if you were, if you were talking to someone, anyone, a new acquaintance, and they were interested in, in opening up to their creative life, what guidance would you give them? What would you say? How, how, how could someone start living that more creative life, getting more into that, that mindset, that frame of mind that allows them to, to open to their own innate care, creativity? Follow your passions. 
um, dreams are like weeds. They don't go away. And, and wouldn't you rather end this life with memories of things you've done rather than dreams of what you didn't do? And I think passions are what must drive us. When I see someone like Michael Bennett or I see someone like um, Jim Henson that were so driven to do the work that they did, what, what was their inspiration? What drove them to do the work? Mm. Their passion for their, for their love, for what they do. And that's the connection that they got from other people by doing that work. That's what dro dro drove them and drives us. So it's, it's really connecting to your passion. If you love music, sit down and play a piano, pick up a guitar, learn the violin, you know, hum, sing. Even if you don't think you're very good, it doesn't matter. It matters that you express yourself and you're probably better than you think. <laughs> <laughs> And you know what? Even if you're not better than you think, the whole point of this is, is that it's not a pick it up today and stop tomorrow. It's a, yeah. it's a begin today. And one of my favorite moments in Julia Cameron's The Artist's Way, she's talking to a friend of hers and he, he's always wanted to learn how to play the piano. Yeah. And she says, well, why don't you start? And he goes, do you have any idea how old I'll be before I'm any good at the piano. And she goes, yeah, exactly the same age you'll be if you never strike a key. So you yeah. might as well, you know? And, well, and I just love that, that change, that one little paragraph changed my life. Absolutely. Why not start? And it's funny. You mentioned Jim Henson and uh, I don't know if you know, but he, you, you must know that he went to the university of Maryland and uh, that rich, my husband actually worked for the parks and rec service and wow. uh at, at, at for the for the county for pg county and when he was a teenager and they found and this is the tragedy of this is that he had had his puppets jim henson had had his puppets in storage and rich didn't realize what he was seeing oh my. and they got thrown away original Jim Henson puppets. Yeah. It might have been some of the Salmon Friends puppets that he used back in DC many, many years ago. Yeah, it, it, it might have been, but they they were in storage because at, at one point Jim Henson had been working for Parks and Rec in the school systems and and working doing puppetry and things like that. So yeah. so Rich got he's like, I got to see them, but he did he was 16 at the time. So he didn't have any power to go, I'll take them off your hands. Oh, but my. uh but wow. there's also uh you if you've never been I encourage you to take a trip down to College Park, Maryland, to the University of Maryland campus and sit on the bench of the yep. Jim Henson statue. Yes. I've always wanted to do that. I've never done that. I will do that. Oh, it's. Um, but I've I, always wanted to do that. I'll have to I'll have to uh, put up a picture of me sitting communing with Jim Henson <laughs> on that bench uh, in the show notes, because it there is something it's it's Jim and it's Kermit. And, and you, it's, it's made in such a way that you can just go sit right next to, right between them, essentially. And it's so, there's something immediately inspiring about that spot. So when we can travel again, I highly encourage you, Paul, <laughs> go and just, and you know. It has Kermit and it has several, it has Ernie and it has Oscar. Um, so the Smithsonian Institute in D.C. is wonderful to go to, too. I was teaching down there. Oh. The first thing I did was I said, I'm going to Smithsonian and see the, the Muppets. So I went down there and saw um, the Muppets that they had at the Smithsonian. They were, their Prairie Dawn was there. It was oh, great. that's yeah. so wonderful. I love it. I love it. And, you know, the Smithsonian has a lot of a lot of cultural touchstones for, for many of us, I'm sure. And it allows, again, that. Can you imagine, again, that, can you imagine it, our life without the arts? No. Arts are what make us human. Arts and, and living creatively are what keep us human. You know, otherwise everything is just technical. But arts is what makes us who we are. And you know what you said just now? I, I want to add on to that because I agree and then some. Arts make us human, but they also inspire us on that technical front. The, the, the flip phone, the, the cellular phone was invented uh -huh. because the person was a Star Trek fan and remembered yeah. the communicators. So <laughs> that, that creative inspiration on the technical front also exists. And as long as we keep, because, you know, somebody said the other day, here we are, we're in lockdown and quarantine and what are people doing? They're turning to the arts. They're turning to television shows and animation and movies and making music and listening to music. They're turning to the arts in times of stress and trouble. We 
we always do. We always turn back towards that spark of, of I, I, I'll call it the divine spark of creativity because I think it is. And yeah. there's something about it that's so, so powerful, no matter what the art is, if, if it speaks to you, like you said a minute ago, if it's your passion, it's going to ignite you and it's going to make you reach for something you never even thought was possible, which I think is incredible. Yeah. I, We're all I, able to do things we never thought we could. Ah, uh, yes. Okay. I love that you said that because I will, I will be very honest and say that I have tried. I know that you're a wonderful pianist and I know that I have tried. I'm a violinist and a guitarist, so I play really well with my left hand, but my right hand is rubbish. So, uh, so, so I am not a pianist, but I love the piano and I would love it if you would be willing to grace me and by extension, the listeners with a little bit of piano before we end this amazing conversation i i know that you are you're so gifted as a creative person <laughs> you're you know no seriously you're a singer you're a dancer you're an actor you're you're a, a, a voice coach and a voice director and an acting coach and an acting director and and the musician and I, you know, you were playing for me a little bit and you said earlier, well, which one of these do you think I should play? And I'm like, all of them, that's <laughs> fine. You know, whichever one you want, but really all of them, I would be completely content with having, because, it, because music is, as you said earlier, music is a language all its own and it's a universal language. I don't know anyone who wouldn't hear La Claire de la Lune or Moonlight Sonata or, or Brandenburg Concerto or Sarah Vaughan singing who would not be moved by it. You know, there, there's something so incredibly vulnerable and magical about it. So would you be willing to do that? Would you be willing to grace me with a little I'd bit of your piano? To. Oh, I yay. Would, um, I'm, I, I don't know how much time you have. Hopefully you'll edit this I down. Have, no, I have all the time in the world. You, <laughs> no, seriously, because, because first of all, I get to talk to, to one of my inspirations, yay. And I get to listen to you play music, double yay. So, so I am, I am at your command where however okay. long you want to play i'm oh just gosh. gonna i'm just gonna listen it's gonna be delightful and i mm -hmm. and and i can guarantee you uh, the many thousands of listeners that i have will also just sit you know we're not driving right now so probably they won't stop their cars because they're not in cars <laughs> but 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 that's you know that's the beauty of sharing music is that you can just relax close your eyes and be part of the experience one of the things i love about classical music is that it's like traveling to another time period Mm -hmm. And um, it's I'm, I feel like I'm communing with Chopin and, and Beethoven and Debussy um, in, from another time, mm -hmm. and it's transportive to to play classical music for me. I do play a little bit of jazz. I'm going to play a little bit of Moonlight Sonata, I think. Yay! Um, yeah, one and of then my favorite love, pieces. <laughs> and then I'd love to play you um, uh, a, a, a jazz piece called What If, which we'll talk about in a moment. But a um, little bit of Moonlight Sonata, then. Perfect. All right, hang on. Let me just adjust my mic here. Ah, um. uh, see, this is the thing that no one tells you. When you're doing these podcasts, you are in a position where you're facing a microphone and you probably have this little black ring in front of you, which is called a pop filter so that you don't pop your peas really hard. But in the meantime, if you want to change things mm. in, live, in live performance, which this is, you end up having to do a lot of different things to make it happen. This is a 1912 Steinway, which was a gift to me uh, from someone very, very dear to me. And uh, it has a long, wonderful story, which is for another time. But here is um, uh, Beethoven's Moonlight Sonata. <laughs>
That was beautiful. Wow. Thank you so much. It's one, That's one of my favorite pieces of music and also my sister's. And she will cry when she hears someone playing it that beautifully. Thank oh, you. Thank you. Wow. Thank you for letting me do that. That was amazing. That oh. was fun. Can I play a little bit of a jazz piece? Do you mind? I not not only do I not mind, I'm excited to hear it. This is going to be so much fun. Go for it. The name of this piece is called What If? It's by Ken Elkinson. I love him. And um, it's it's based on two simple chords. And uh, the two major seventh chords, E flat major and D flat major with a ninth. And it's asking what if, what if, what if, which are my two of my favorite words in the English language. That is such a beautifully introspective piece. My goodness. And it's the same thing I would say to a musician is to discover the text in the moment. Really speak the thought, have a relationship, you know, and um, it's all music. Everything that we do is music. It, it is. And, and it's interesting how if you had decided to play um, some, some piece that was more romantic, let's say, or a piece that was more frolicking, we would feel that way at the end, both you as a performer and, and us as the audience, we would, we would be uplifted or we would be changed by having participated in listening. Do you, do you know what I mean? Oh, sure. I, how wonderful. How, what a gift. Thank you so much. I, I cannot... This has been a gift for you to to uh, let me open up. Thank you for. Not everybody wants to hear from me all the time. So oh, uh, I beg to differ. But you know, uh, that, that's it's funny because I've been I've been telling some of my uh, fellow students in your classes. Guess what? 
Paul's going to be, and everyone's like, no way. So, <laughs> so everybody is super excited. I have now hundreds of people <laughs> who are, who are excited to, to listen to, to what, uh, to what, to, to the wisdom and to the joy and to the love that you've been speaking about today. Yeah. I'm can I give so you grateful. Can places where people can find me? Oh, um, uh, absolutely. I want you to tell me yeah. all that and I'm going to put the links to everything yeah. on the show notes so that, so that you can, uh, so that you, people can more easily find you for sure. Take the children you love to www.curiousgeorge.com. Harcourt Mifflin created this beautiful web page, and it's different than the PBS version of Curious George. And um, you'll hear me as the man in the yellow hat, as well as George. <laughs> and uh, let's help George, you know. And um, <laughs> I it's love it. Games and stories and wonderful things. It's an award-winning uh, web page, uh, and it's all based on the original books of Curious George. And in the books, Curious George is a little more ornery than he and he became on PBS. So, um, and and PBS version is is uh, Frank Welker, who I adore. And uh, he's one of my inspirations as a voice actor. But um, also you can find me on Facebook. If you are interested in voice acting, come to a page called Voice Over Tune Up and you'll find Paula Birdie's Voice Over Community. And you'll find me there. You can also find me on Facebook. Um, and uh, it's, just, um, it's just wonderful to be part of the Voice Over Community. I find voice actors to be the most giving of all actors. They're, they're willing to help you out and you know, share their information and their knowledge with other actors in such a wonderful, warm way. And I try and help create that community and inspire all those beautiful actors every day on that page. So that's what that's about. And you can also find me on a wonderful page called Michael Bennett and his musicals on Facebook. And uh, there I connect a lot of uh, the, the singers and dancers and actors and fans of, of Michael Bennett from dream girls and company and follies and Coco and all the people that were in those shows a chorus line are all on that page, many of them. And as we have a birthday, you'll you know see all these wonderful people reach out to each other, and it's just very exciting to create that community too. Wow, I had no idea. This is this is brand new Paul Liberty scoop. I had no idea oh, that you yeah. were on oh, there. Page. Yeah, you got to go there. It's such a it's one of the warmest places on Facebook, I think, especially musical theater, because it's connecting everybody, the fans and the people that were there doing it. And those that work with Michael, those that were dance captains for Michael, they're all on that page. And they're such incredible people. And I, I'm inspired by them all because I got to work with all of them too. Um, and many of those performers on those, on those pages, I, I, wow. I got to work with. And, and those that I didn't, I now get to know them through that page. Wow, that's so, so wonderful. Yeah. There's something so special about, about that kind of, uh, it's, it's almost, I, it's not time travel as much as it's a, it's a strand that connects you to to the creativity of the past i just watched a video the other day of uh, the hamilton cast singing yeah. um oh what, what was it they sang was it god i they, hope i get it sang what i did for love from what i did yeah uh, and they it was incredible because at the end they got the original cast up on stage yeah. it was in i just and I, i'm sitting there weeping and rich is going what is going on you don't understand they just had a chorus line. so so yeah there's there's that touchstone from the past is so wonderful uh I, before before i i leave you to your life and let yes. you go i have just a couple more things that i'd love to know if you could have a, a plane sky write anything for all the world to see what would it be what would you want what would you want to tell us Written in the sky. Mm -hmm. um, well, the word love comes to mind, and love each other. I mean, that's the greatest teaching anybody can give you is to love yourself. And the other word that comes to mind is forgive. And I think we must always forgive ourselves, and forgive yourself. I think I would put that in the sky. Forgive yourself. Mm. It's okay to forgive yourself, and um, and and love. That's the answer to everything. The answer to every question truly is love. It is. I, I attain to, I, I aspire to that. I haven't gotten there yet. <laughs> I'm going to call myself a work in progress. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I love what you said about forgiveness. There's a David Mamet movie called House of Games from mm -hmm. the nineties that I adore. I think it's a, it's a, what a psychological thriller and the sort of tagline from the movie uh, informally, because I don't think it was the tagline was when you do something, when you've done something unforgivable, forgive yourself. Yeah. 
And I thought, wow, that's incredible. I mean, the movie is not, it's not about nice people. There are no nice people in that movie ultimately, yeah. but, but this idea of, of digging deep inside yourself, accepting that you've done something that could be painful or hurtful uh, and, and forgiving yourself so that you can do better next time and make yeah, amends and grow. Right. Yeah. Not hold on to the, forgiving yourself is the hardest forgiveness you will find in your life. You can forgive others, but forgiving yourself is the most difficult. And it's one that I'm striving to really always find every day, truly. Yeah. And, and it's, it's a, it's a wonderful thing to, to strive for, I think, if for mm -hmm. all of us, because there's nobody walking around that doesn't have some sort of uh, pain or ache or hurt. But if we can forgive ourselves and we can then forgive others, then, then, we, can, then we can put down those burdens. And that's such a freeing thing. I love yeah. that, the idea of that. What a freeing thing. Yeah. And one last thing, because I am going to put all of this stuff, there's going to be all this stuff on, on the show notes page. It's going to be wonderful. No, it, there's going to be a tome written on it, just on, on my adoration and respect for you. I, I wanted I to know. I for you, Isolde. Oh. You're, you've grown as an actress in so many beautiful ways, but it's really about finding yourself. And I, I really love the actress you, you're, you're becoming and you've become. I thank you. I, I'm grateful that you said that. That's lovely to hear. Uh, and I love it. You know, being 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 a performer and sharing art in that way is unlike anything. It, whether it, honestly, to me, it's stage work and and being a musician or doing doing acting of any way that connects to people is thrilling and humbling at the same time. It's it's magic. I think you're right. It's just it's magic. It is it is. Uh, it's a chance for us to look into the cauldron and bring out something that's never been before. And I think that's incredible. Yeah. So is there anything else that you would like to leave us with any, any last bit of wisdom or words or anything yes. that you'd like to say? There is something I'd love to add. And that is something I learned from Jim Henson um, and just doing the work that we do. It is someone else's success is not your failure. And as an actor and as a performer, I think the most difficult thing for us to deal with is the daily sense of rejection that we get from mm -hmm. the work that we do. And when you're seeing other people around you succeeding, especially with social media, it can be hurtful too, to think mm -hmm. that why is this person succeeding and I'm not? Someone else's success is also your success. So it's important to understand that as you see others succeed, it doesn't mean you failed it means you succeeded too. And it sh proves to you that there's an opportunity for you to succeed as well. And that's the mind shift that we must make is that there's opportunity around for us around every corner, every moment. And we must always look for that and seek that. And we will see the word world in a different and beautiful, beautiful way. Ah, uh, that's so wonderful. I love this idea you just brought over from the depths of your soul, which I think is great is, is to be open to it, you know, to be open yeah. because it's there and it's, and it's full of possibility, which I just love. I cannot thank you enough, Paul. This has been thank so, you. so oh, yeah. wonderful. And, yeah. and, and I hope that at some point you'll be willing to, to uh, put up with more of my questions and come back on the show. <laughs> I would love to. Are you kidding? If you'll put up with my piano playing, I'll, oh. I'll come <laughs> I will celebrate your piano playing. Are you kidding? This is, I, 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 this, what a treat. What a, what a fabulous treat to, to hear yet another sort of glint in your diamond. You know, what, what a wonderful thing that, that you have yet this other facet to, to your creative life that is so beautiful. And so, I mean, you've probably heard this before from other people who've heard you play, but every note you strike is heartfelt and it comes through in the playing. It just, it just does. So thank you so much for saying thank you. Oh, it, it was, I'm just, see what you didn't see because you were playing and you couldn't hear. I turned everything else off and I muted myself. I turned off my monitor and I just closed my eyes and I listened to you play because it was, <laughs> it was such a, it was so, it was, it was moving and delightful at the same time because A, you were playing one piece I know so well and another piece that I didn't know and just feeling your, love for for the instrument that you're playing first of all and also your love for the music was ah so delightful. thank you thank you 
Oh, mm. okay. Okay. Back to back on track is older back on track. Okay. Yeah. So uh, thank you, Paul. And, yes, and thank you. I'm grateful beyond belief. And I'm glad that you're going to be willing to come back because I didn't get to all my questions. So oh, if, yeah, it's going to be more, 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 more. And, and I'd love to talk soon. more Muppets too. I'd love to yes. talk about my experiences with Jim Henson and Jane Henson and, and his kids and, 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 and so much of, of, of uh, experiences of life. I also worked at the Grand Ole Opry in Nashville, Tennessee. See, this is what I'm talking about. We we have like another 14 episodes that we're going to yeah. be doing with Paul Liberty, yeah. one after the other. No, <laughs> I know, I know. It's a I I won't monopolize your time too much, but but I do hope, and I'm really grateful that you're going to come back and talk more about that, and also more about your as as you learn more about your own process, because it's so fascinating to see how you're such a multifaceted creative person, yet you make all of it work, and you spend time teaching others to help yeah. them find that within themselves too. So I'm really grateful and, th and thank you again. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. Okay. I say this too, I love you, Isolde. Thank you. Oh, so much. Paul, I love you too. You're thank just you so the best. <laughs> Okay, I'm going to I'm going to have to stop this mutual admiration society right now okay. to say thank you for all of you who are listening. I hope that you have enjoyed this conversation even a tenth of how much I enjoyed it because it's with one of my teachers and getting a chance to talk to one of your teachers and really ask the questions that you that you want to know. It's so special. It's so wonderful and it allowed me the opportunity to get to know one of my mentors better. And I highly, I cannot recommend enough that you go to Paul's Facebook page and you get to know him as a performer, as an artist, as a creative, and, and just as a beautiful, wonderful spirit and person. So find him, get to him, take classes with him if you ever have a chance to, because wow, is he incredible. Get, get enriched by knowing this man. Seriously, you will. I mean, that's just how it is. You will. And I want to say thank you for listening. And I hope that you enjoyed this episode. And I know I'm repeating myself, but you know, that's what happens when you get excited. You repeat <laughs> yourself. So so thank you so much. If you are enjoying the show, please consider leaving a review for the podcast wherever you listen, whether it's Google Podcasts or iTunes, and also get in touch with me and get in touch with Paul and let him know and me know questions that you have and ideas that you have and thoughts that you have because we're all in this together and we're all going to make it work together. So thank you once again. This is Isolde Trachtenberg for the Creative Mindset Podcast, sending you all of my love and I'll see you next time. Thanks so much for joining me today. I really appreciate you being here. Please subscribe to the podcast if you're new, and please tell your friends about the community we're building here. Today's episode was produced by Isolde Trachtenberg and is copyright Isolde Trachtenberg 2019. Today's music was from Kevin McLeod, Laser Groove, and Ava Marimba, brought to you by Creative Commons License 3.0. As always, please remember this is for educational and entertainment purposes only. Past performance does not guarantee future results, although we can always hope. Until next time, I send you all all of my love. <laughs>